It's so wonderful to see you all here today for this uh, session that we have planned for you this afternoon. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from Ebequit in Mi'kma'ki, which is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. As we are gathering today on a virtual platform, it is important to respectfully acknowledge the history, spirituality, culture, and rights of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples from coast to coast to coast who have called this land and home since time immemorial and who continue to experience the ongoing effects of colonialism and systemic racism. This acknowledgement is nothing without action to back it up and I encourage everyone to consider how we can each in our own way actively honor and uphold our obligations in a spirit of true reconciliation. After all, we are all treaty people. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Institute of Island Studies, we're a research, education, and public policy institute based at the University of Prince Edward Island here in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. You can learn more about what we do by checking out our website, which is islandstudies.com, or on our social media accounts, which Maggie will post the links to shortly. The Institute of Island Studies has been hosting the lecture series, the Island Lecture Series, in a few different formats for almost three decades now. So we're excited to be able to offer our events on a virtual platform this year because it means that you can join us from all over the world or just down the road or across the hall from the comfort and safety of your own homes. At this point, we usually send our newsletter sign-up sheet around the room. That would be Jim Randall doing that. And hi, Jim, I see you out there today. Uh, but things are a bit different now that we've gone virtual. So if you'd like to sign up for our monthly newsletter, please feel free to pop your email in the chat or send it to us directly. No spam, we promise. If you're not comfortable sharing your email in Zoom, no worries. You can also subscribe directly. Maggie has just popped the link into the chat. So let me get to the introduction of our speaker. This afternoon, we're thrilled to be joined by Dr. Rory McCabe coming to us live from Clare Island in Ireland. Rory recently completed his PhD at the Center for Irish Studies at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And by recently, I mean last Wednesday. Congratulations, Dr. McCabe. Rory's doctoral research, which will be, he'll be discussing with us today, examined music making and islandness within his home community of Clare Island. Rory also holds a Bachelor of Music and a Master's in Ethnomusicology and is a mus musician himself, favoring anything with strings and frets. Rory was originally lined up to do this lecture in person last March while he was here on PEI as a visiting scholar, thanks to an Ireland Canada University Foundation Flaherty Scholarship. We've been planning the visit with all sorts of activities and guest lectures since March 2018, but unfortunately, COVID scuttled our plans. He did get to participate in one of my classes on March 9th, which was a joint class with Dr. Je Andrew Jennings class at the UH University of Highlands and Islands in Scotland in Shetland actually, but then you will recall that fateful day, Friday the 13th, when everything changed. Rory had to go into quarantine before packing up and flying back to Ireland on the 18th. 10 days is definitely not enough to get, not enough time to get to know PEI, so we do hope that he'll be able to come visit us again properly in the future. But in the meantime, we are glad to be able to use video technology to zoom Rory in from his home on Clare Island. So to start us off, Rory is going to speak for about 20 minutes about his research. Then he and I will have an informal chat, followed by some questions from you, the audience. As Maggie has already mentioned, we'd love to hear your thoughts. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please send them in the chat and we'll work them in to the Q&A part of our discussion. So with that, I'll hand it over to Rory Take it away, Dr. McCabe. Thank you, Laurie, uh, for the introduction and welcome to everyone from all over. I see quite a lot of people in this room. Um, this is more people in this room now than is normally in this room I'm in. So uh, forgive me if I'm a little bit slow to start, but as uh, Maggie said at the outset, this is like a fireside chat of sorts. So. As the setting here today is an interdisciplinary area of island studies, 
uh, I want to give you a general rather than a subject specific overview of my research with the aim of exploring how ethnographic research of music making is a valuable contribution to island studies. I titled the pres this presentation, uh, Music Making and the Experience of Community Life on an Irish Island. Suitably vague, but with key points in the title. There's three parts today for this talk I'm giving. Um, first, I will introduce my islander slash scholarly approach to the PhD research. Then I will discuss ethnography as a research tool for examining island experience. And to finish, I'll describe music making as the framework which ties all of this together. To see if I can get the proper view. Um, as an islander, I was drawn to my PhD research with the desire to represent Clare Island, that is the experience of island life from the perspective of the people who live there. From my interest in ethnomusicology and, anthrop and anthropology, I recognized ethnography as arguably the best means of representing the insider or islander perspective. As a research tool, ethnography provides powerful means for analyzing human social interactions within specific field locations. Put simply, ethnographic research involves observing and participating in events relevant to the field site and the research question. And most importantly, it involves speaking to or interviewing the other people in the setting. All of this is in the, in the goal of attempting to build an understanding of their perspective and experience. My goal at the start of the PhD was to develop a history of Clare Island music making during the 20th century and couple that with an ethnographic account of music making in the present. My interest was on music in the public domain, spaces where islanders join face to face in real time community. By focusing on the structures and settings of music making within the community, my aim was to describe the particularities of island life in the 21st century. That was where it started. And this was refined multiple times through the process of the PhD itself. Over the last 100 years, Clare Island and other Irish islands have been subject to many forms of representation and they're entwined in various narratives at local and national level. A few of these readings give authority to the insider perspective and some accounts even misrepresent features of island life. As I began the research, I realized that island studies with its aims of revealing distortions in the literature and the aim of studying islands on their own terms, I realized that island studies would be an important ally for my ethnographic aims. I was drawn to Godfrey Balachino's suggestion that island studies functions to redress the dominance of mainland gaze in representing islands and that island studies takes the position of, quote, privileged privileging commentary from the inside out rather than from the outside in. But to get closer to Clare Island, let's begin from the outside in. Clare Island, and I'll try and bring up a, an image here if it'll work for me. Yes, so there we go. Clare Island fall, falls under the broad umbrella of the islands of Ireland. The Irish Islands Federation lists 26 inhabited offshore islands with a total popula population of 2,746, according to the 2016 national census. Measured in terms of state demographics, islanders represent a fraction of a percentage of the total population of 4.7 million. Despite regional and historical differences, the Irish islands are often portrayed as a coherent whole and Clare Island shares aspects of its history with these other islands, particularly in the interactions with the state and in the popular perceptions and descriptions of Irish island life. Throughout the 20th century, commentators cite depopulation, peripherality, or lack of infrastructure as markers of unsustainability and a certain deficiency or poverty in island life. But there were different outcomes in the development of island communities over the last 100 years. Some were abandoned and some survived. In 2021, small communities continue to inhabit the islands and to defy earlier predictions of their decline. In their dealings with the state, the Irish islands have benefited from a group identity. But while all islanders experience similar issues in their connection to the mainland, 
each island community responds to different internal challenges. Moreover, each island community is a collection of individuals acting within their own historically defined social environment. Just change this image. The fieldwork site of my research is the small island community on Clare Island, an island around five kilometres off the County Mayo coastline in the west of Ireland. According to the 2016 census, there are 159 people living here. The island is roughly seven and a half kilometres long and four kilometres at its widest point and covers an area of around 1,640 hectares. The landscape is dominated by two hills. There's a smaller peak in the middle, which is around 221 meters and a larger, the big hill at the end is 462 meters. The island has an interesting cultural history with evidence of settlement during the Neolithic period, that's about four to five and a half thousand years ago. There's a medieval abbey. There's a shell of a 16th century castle associated with the legendary pirate queen and proto-feminist Grace O'Malley. And there's numerous other features of archaeological, historical, social and literary significance. As stated earlier, I adopted an ethnographic approach in my research as I wanted to represent Clare Island from the perspective of the people who live there. This counters the outsider or mainland gaze, a perspective which often renders islanders as anonymous and presents Clare Island as a geographical space with people inserted into it which is in effect what the previous description that I just gave of Clare Island does. While Clare Island's landscape, its population statistics, its history and its place as an Irish island describe Clare Island, they say nothing about the community or the shared experience of islandness. As an ethnographer and an islander, I approach Clare Island not as a geographical space with people inserted into it, but as a social or communal space within a particular environmental setting. Just to go off on a slight tangent, the empirical measurements available through census figures present an interesting point of examining how ethnography dif differs from other measures of island life. The narrative of, of island population decline is a widely acknowledged theme in the discussion of the Irish island as a whole and commentary on Clare Island often notes the rapid decline from a high of 1,615 in 1841 to 845 in 1851. This is followed by a steady decrease over the next 100 years. But these 19th century population highs are not within the experience of Clare Island life in the 21st century. The oldest research participant in my study was born in the 1930s and their earliest recollections are of community life in the 1940s. In terms of empirical data, the 1926 census represents the limits of community memory in 2020 or 2021 as we're in now and presents a relevant ethnographic frame for examining population changes on Clare Island. Into the weeds a little bit more, between 1926 and 1946 census figures, there was only a gradual decline in population from relatively gradual from 378 to 310. However, in the following 20 year period, the community witnessed a more dramatic drop from 310 in 1946 to 167 in 1966. In this 20 year period, the population fell by some 142 individuals, almost halving uh, 46% in a generation. The population decline from the 1940s to the 1960s, it certainly affected the experience of island life and music making. But the thing is, the island population has remained relatively stable since the 1960s. In the 50 year period from the 1966 to the 2016 census, the Clare Island population fluctuated within a relatively stable range of a, a low of 127 in 1981 to back up to 168 in 2011. The thing is, these fluctuations tell very different stories when measured in terms of statistic, statistical percentages and community life. 
But the overall fi figures show that from the 1960s onwards, Clare Islanders have experienced relative stability. For over 50 years, the current population range has proven socially viable, and Islanders under 60 years of age have no real memory of a larger community grouping. Overall, this suggests that the Clare Island experience in 2021 has little connection to the dominant narratives of population decline. But the ethnographic approach refines the question of population further and highlights the constant change in the experience of community size. The 2016 census figures again were 159 residents with 84 males and 75 females. But from the insider perspective, from the Islander perspective, these figures vary depending on the particular weekday, the month or year, as many aspects of island life operate at seasonal intervals. Some islanders live a bifurcated existence, traveling in and out of the community to meet changing patterns of employment, yet they maintain a strong social connection with the island, returning for weekends, community events and holiday periods. These arrangements shift yearly as employment opportunities, romantic partnerships and changing family circumstances create different levels of commitment to or away from the island. Some islanders who live permanently on the mainland also maintain their presence within the island community and participate in major communal gatherings. Altogether, these people are part of the, their participants in island music making. Although population statistics are valuable from the insider perspective, music making and social life depends more on the internal measures and subjectivity of the island experience rather than external objectivity. Ethnographic research allows us to investigate human agency, choice and detail that is hidden behind numbers and trends. And small islands in turn put faces and names back onto the abstract analysis of human social and cultural systems. Having highlighted ethnography as a means of expressing insider or islander experience. I want to describe how an ethnography of island music making might be used to examine island community and even provide markers of community sustainability. I use the term music making to describe music performance in the widest sense. My focus is on everything that happens surrounding the sounds. So I look at the who, the what, the why, the when, and the where of, um, of music on Clare Island. This is an ethnomusicological perspective, which considers music as a social process as much as a cultural product. Another way to think of it is that I examine music on Clare Island from the position of someone who cannot hear the music. Music making then refers to the practices, the context, and the settings through which the island community encounters musical sounds. Through this framing, music making on Clare Island represents and articulates a wider experience of island life. Also, since music making connects across multiple arenas of island life, I propose that music making on Clare Island is a marker of overall community health or vitality. The example of traditional Irish set dancing. Through my ethnographic research of island music making, as defined above, the, the focus shifts from the sounds and the dance figures to ask questions such as, where does dancing take place? What are the surrounding social contexts for dance? Who dances? And ultimately, why do islanders dance in certain locations at certain times? Set dance is also a useful example because in the ethnographic time frame of community experience, say from the 1940s to the present, it remains a consistent part of Clare Island social life. In this period, dancing continued against a backdrop of social, infrastructural and economic changes. In the second half of the 20th century, media technology increased daily connection to the outside world and to other musics. From the 1960s onward, new infrastructural developments led to a growth in island tourism and introduced new incentives for music making. Then during the 1980s, several key modernizations revolutionized domestic life. There was electricity supply in 1983, group water scheme in 1986, and the full-time employment opportunities offered by the Clare Island Sea Farm from, the 19, from 1987 onwards. Then from the early 1990s, greater public spending by the state led to improved services, improvements in the roads, and the establishment of a subsidized ferry schedule. All of these changes impacted island music making and transformed the experience of island life. 
until the 1960s and much later, music on Clare Island was an entirely self-sufficient live performance activity. Islanders played music for other Islanders, often in the domestic settings of house dances. Musical sounds were predominantly as an accompaniment to set dancing, and the dances themselves were local variants of wider traditional forms. Dance was a form of entertainment for the dancers and an integral part of socializing. Fast forward to the second decade of the 21st century and set dancing remains popular. However, the main outlet is the annual summer concert series or session organized by the Clare Island branch of Kyoto's Kyoto Erin. That's a national organization that are aimed to promote Irish music and language. Set dancing now occurs mostly at the, in the Clare Island Community Centre, which is a space constructed with state funding and within a performance setting organised by a national cultural organisation. In this setting, the dancers are often accompanied by mainland musicians and perform in front of, a, of mainland spectators. So islanders are still dancing, sometimes the same dance forms even, and to the same musical sounds, but the where, why and when have changed. What was once an integral part of socialising, an activity repeated many times in an evening, now is usually a single display at the Kyoto session nights. From one perspective, set dancing on Clare Island is an anachronism or an entertainment from an earlier period in island life. One might say the continuity of set dancing indicates a desire to maintain traditions. However, through the lens of a ethnographic study of island music making, I see the changing circumstances of set dancing and music as indicative of gradual shifts in island social life. The shifting circumstances of dancing represent islanders drive to adapt social customs and maintain opportunities for social bonding through music making. For the island community, the changing context, of, the changing context and settings of dance are less important than the fact that islanders still dance, still take part. To conclude this part of the, the event, um, as an activity involving communal participation, music making becomes a measure of island sustainability or community vitality. I propose that the willingness of people to participate through music making in the symbolic construction of a group identity is a mark of Clare Island's vitality as a community. Island vitality proposes subtle qualities of aliveness and a power of enduring with antonyms of inactivity or lifelessness. There are, after all, island communities that no longer exist. In the 21st century, an assessment of island vitality indicates that a community is actively engaged in sustaining its own cultural life. Island vitality suggests that islanders are socially active and engaged with each other. As a form of social participation, music making expresses both the multiple layers of community life and a manifestation of island vitality. My ethnographic research of island music making suggests that island survival comes from within. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. And so this is where if we were in the audience live, we would all be going, yay! Thank you. But you can use the little uh, hand if you want under uh, reactions and, and give uh, Rory a, a virtual hand if you want. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you. Thanks. There's so much to, to, to think about and digest in, in your um, your talk today. And I had the uh, um, good fortune to be able to read your, your dissertation beforehand. I skimmed through it. I didn't have a whole lot of time, but it was just beautifully written. And you captured so much about island studies in there. And you've mentioned so many things that are, are top of mind for me in my own island studies scholarship. Um, first of all is islandness. Right. Um, this is something that I'm very passionate about and I teach here in the Master of Arts and Island Studies program. And so I'm just wondering, um, one of the challenges that we've come up against in island studies is defining what you mean by islandness. Some people who live on islands don't even know about the word. They just live it and breathe it. And yet they, you know, it's so hard to articulate, even though they live it every day. Have you come up, up against that? And, and um, you know, what are some of the hallmarks of islandness for you? Uh, thank you, Laurie. First off, I'll just say that the format, I find it very disconcerting because my face is very small, so I can't even see if I'm looking at the camera, so apologies. Um, 
Yeah, idleness, um, that was one of the tasks of the dissertation was to come up with some way of describing a coherent experience of, of islandness. Because in one sense, there are as many different experiences in, in island life as there are outside of island life. And people have, have you know, individuals have their own inclinations and you know, personal, personal experiences and so on. So I tried to find uh, some commonalities and that, that through them, we might define an islandness specific to Clare Island, but also which could potentially be applied to other islands, but I'd have to, that would be another topic. But so for me, I discovered islandness as, as three, three frameworks, really the population, because of course, population size de determines a lot about how you experience life in a small community. And the population in turn uh, is reflected in the built infrastructure so pop that to the other side of the experience, like an island, like Clare Island with a small population and a small built infrastructure that shapes the, the community experiences, the opportunities to gather, the opportunities to make music. And these things change over time. And, you know, you could take the, the example of Clare Island contrast then that against, I don't know, some similar size island with with a much larger population and more resources so population and built infrastructure and then the third thing is the the environment so the seasonality really and that ties into sea travel and um i i haven't quite decided if it's if the sea or seasonality and i i see them as together so through these three things that is the the, these are the frames that mm -hmm. shape the experience of the group of people. E even if the group of people on Clare Island have their own individual outlooks, they each engage with community size. They, they all engage with the built infrastructure and they all experience the weather through the sea, through the seasons and the way that the seasons influence uh, interaction with the outside world, and tourism and so on and so forth. Mm. So, for me, islandness is is, is three fr is frameworks that shape the group experience. Yeah, and that's one of the things. Is there enough shared um, those kinds of characteristics shared amongst islands across the world to to even think about it as as being um, something that is is tangible, right? Or is it always intangible? But I think you're onto something. I like the way you framed that. Um, Jim Randall has just a sort of similar question in the how does islandness um, lend itself to ethnography? And so this is I I. I can think about my own answer to that, but I'm, I'm curious about yours. Or does it? I think it does. Well, islands, islands present a very neat, you know, bounded picture frame for looking at a, a group, like a social group, which lends itself to um, There are polls, it's not over on islands because, the assumption sometimes that islands are coherent inside the you know inside the the, the borders, but of course, any ethnography is is this, you define the field before you approach it, and you define it through um, through the questions you ask. So islands have benefits, but there are pitfalls too. But it's it's really ethnography. I won't say it's, it has to exist independently, but it. Uh, It's, it's a th thing you have to approach from an ethnographic, uh, from due ethnographic uh, consideration, I suppose. Mm, wonderful. Um, you talked at the end, towards the end of your talk today about um, islands and music making and sustainability. I was just, and, and I, I've heard you speak about being able to read islands um, in this way. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I think that's such an important point and um, one of the, the really key messages that might be coming out of your dissertation and your talk today. Sorry, would you mind just rephrasing that slide? Well, it's sort of um, at the end of your talk, you were talking about how music making is a way to gauge a health and vitality of a community okay. and, and to read an island in, in that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, can you just talk yeah. about, a little bit more about that? So, as I was rushing through what I had presented, maybe I was conscious of time and technology, but 
I was trying to hint at the or make the suggestion that islands are often are in Ireland certainly the, the question of population is a big one and in in the last 100 years it certainly has been a dominant topic especially up until the 70s and 80s when the assumption was that islands were doomed and the evidence was that population was falling and of course you know islands without people they're still islands but they're not island communities so island population is an important vital statistic of health as were well. and then that's coupled with infrastructure because without a, an infrastructure to support it island communities such as in a shark kind of galway they'll face such difficulties that they often they decided to to um to move to the mainland but Apart from infrastructure and population, I was looking for a way to ask the question, like, why do people stay on islands? And it's, it's not just about infrastructure and population because um, you can, like, why do more the, why, why do island communities persist? Why do people keep a sense of, of belonging to island communities more than why do people stay on islands? And music sort of a way it became a way of looking at cultural cultural life it became a way of examining how people participate in the social space of island life so i'm just thinking through this now um if if you want to if, if you wanted to pursue the question further i'll be happy to <laughs> No, I think that there might be some um, more work coming out of your dissertation after you've um, talked more about it and thought more about it. It's, it's, um, it, and that's what's going to be my last question, but I'll save it. You know, what's next? But um, I have a couple of others, and then I have some that are popping up in the chat here, which is absolutely terrific to see so many people asking these great questions. Um, I, I <clears throat> before I come to that, I do want to ask though about um, the phenomenon now all around the world with the pandemic putting a stop to live live music and sessions and gatherings in people's kitchens and stuff like that. So many performers here in Atlanta, Canada are um, pivoting to online kitchen parties and performances and concerts. And, and um, it's, it's just this amazing thing that people are doing. And, and even thinking about the, the sea shanty thing that's going viral in these last couple of days, what's that all about, right? In, in um, gauging um, people's health and, and, uh, and society's health that music is such, is, they're clinging to it in so many ways using all of these technologies. So I'm just wondering, is this happening in on your side of the Atlantic as well? And what does it say about the human urge to, to make music and to build community um, even during a pandemic? Well, personally, in this last, this last year, I've been really just looking at my computer screen trying to finish off my dissertation. So I haven't really engaged with that, but I'm, I'm aware of, online concerts and all these things happening and some of it is clearly you know anybody involved any professional musicians looking for outlets to perform and i won't say anything about that but what i can say is that uh through my research i would be strongly convinced that participating in music making so gathering together and sharing social space of music and sound and whether that be dancing or singing or playing um that's a very important part of community building um not only important it's it's i i, I suggested it's a vital vital part uh the problem is it cannot be measured quantitatively yeah it's it kind of be put on a spreadsheet and added up it's it's a qualitative uh feature of community life so when you remove those opportunities i think people they look for them they they begin to be continuing the the health metaphors they can be nutritionally deficient perhaps mm -hmm. uh, but i'm noticing here on clare island that the, the the amount the amount of social interaction through music making that's needed is not it's not uh, it's not much but it's needed still so like here on Clare Island 
a lot of the music making happens during the summer months, like especially in the last 20 years, 30 years. So, so you'll have a glut of activity from June, July and August, and then it'll be fairly quiet until there might be a little bit of, you know, stuff at Christmas and then maybe around St. Patrick's Day, maybe at Easter, but it's, it's not that there's a quantity of stuff, but it's that there's this, continual injection injection of gathering together sharing the social space bonding through music and at the moment that's missing for everybody and like i'm used to it in the island here on clare island but for people outside who are not used to isolate you know living in an isolated setting it must be a must be far stronger i don't know yeah. so um yeah, I, I I see multiple things there with, with these online these online concerts, but I definitely understand where it's coming from. Yeah, well, there's a whole other couple of PhD projects for somebody else, eh? Um, <laughs> um, also, I've had a few questions coming in the chat that are specific to Clare Island, and yeah. uh, someone was um, wondering: Is the Irish? Um, it's um, Sasha and Jerry Bradley from Vancouver. Is the Irish language spoken on Clare Island, and are there any any legendary musicians, living or dead, from your island? Um, we're a non gaelic island, which means we don't officially speak Irish, though some people might speak Irish. Uh, and I think since since the turn of the ninth, you know, the twentieth century, English has been widely spoken on the island. As for legendary musicians, well, there's definitely people who think they're legendary and who are, deserve to be counted as legendary. But there's nobody um, there's nobody famous, if that's what you're asking. Okay. <laughs> Um, another question that comes from Roy Johnstone here in Prince Edward Island, who uh, is part of the uh, Irish sessions at the Old Triangle. And if you'd stuck around, been able to stick around a little longer, yeah. I'm sure you would have met. He's just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about sessions on Clare Island and, and how they work. And, and you talked a bit about it in your presentation, but is there anything you can add to that? Um, yeah, how do people come and, and is it inclusive? And what about young people? And is, does this sort of thing happen all over Ireland? Ireland, that kind of thing. Uh, well, speaking just of Clare Island, because uh, all the people who speak about music are traditional music sessions outside of Clare Island, but um, the community centre Kyoltis session, which I mentioned there at the end of the, the presentation, that's the main outlet. That would be the, sort of the real outlet for traditional music on the island for the last 10 years anyway. And that's, it's very inclusive session, but it's it's not, a, it, there aren't sessions like uh, like the ones that he's, he's asking about where there's a regular event and people gather and they perform. So these, these things happen, say, during July and August, um, every Tuesday night, and there's guest musicians invited in. And then within that space, very inclusive. Like, no, um, there's lots of singing, there's dancing, there's instrumental performance, but uh, there are none of the the sessions like you'd have at the is the old triangle that you, mm -hmm. you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. There the wouldn't be sessions like that. It'd be just more concentrated in summertime events. Now, this is not to say that spontaneous performances don't pop up now and again, but there there's nothing structured like that anyway. Mm. He was also wondering about young people. Um, I know here on Prince Edward Island, we have a lot of uh, young people following in the tr traditions of their families, the Chasons from Surrey and the, the Galants from Rustico and stuff like that. Do young people get involved in, in the sessions and in, yeah. in music in general? Yeah, very, very, very much so. Uh, there's a quite strong interest in music performance on the island amongst the younger population and a lot of traditional music performance and pop music. Um, Mm -hmm. at the, again, at the sessions that I described, the, the young people would dance, the set dancing, they've sort of really taken it on. And that's because of people in the community who like, um, who have taken their time to teach the kids. And it's also been a strong drive in the school to um, give instrumental tuition. So that's really supported the, the younger population. But there's, there's a, there are histories of families with with um, 
families of musicians and um yes sorry yeah, yeah it's almost like they have it in their it's in their genetic makeup or something <laughs> some, of, some of these folks i'm just so so envious in some ways <laughs> well it's it provides it like in the past playing music was was functional too in that if you learned some tunes on the on the accordion or the fiddle you could provide music for dancers at the house dances mm -hmm. so like it was it served a function in within the social setting too. So if um, that's slightly changed in, in the, into the present where there's a more performative aspect to it and maybe tendency towards or an appreciation of virtuosity, but, uh, and of course certain families have, maybe have, have, uh, have more interest, I don't know. Yeah. For sure. Um, I have a question here from Deirdre from Connemara, who I think you know. She I says do. that um, he, um, she imagines Islanders might have talked with you about the loss of the venues where such some, where they've occurred, but did they also talk about the impact of what those specific losses were on their communities and on their lives? Sorry, the losses of the of their of the impact of such specific losses of of community. Sorry, do you mind? I'm just going to look for that question and read it because I don't... Um... Ah, so she says, I imagine Islanders might have talked about the loss of venues where such occurred. Did they talk much about the impact of such specific losses? Um, not particularly. Um, the Obviously, there's, a fo there's fondness in recollection, but overall... I would say that Islanders, particularly the ones who continue to engage in music making and come out in public and participate, that they see it as part of, uh, like, as I said, like as I said in the in the presentation, that it's more important that people are playing and dancing and participating in some sort of a venue than not playing at all. So. Um, that sense of loss wasn't really expressed to me and it wasn't really something that I was looking at too much. So I, yeah. Hmm. Okay. And then Deb from Argenta, British Columbia, um, adds to Deirdre's question by saying, are there defined venues where traditionally on Clare Island uh, that music is shared and are these places usually indoor or are there particular traditional outdoor areas where individuals or groups perform, such as a park with a central gazebo, gazebo versus indoors at a community hall? So in the, in the, over the last 100 years, which is my, my frame that I look at, uh, music making is mainly an indoor activity. And of course, you know, with the weather we have around here, I don't think you'd be planning too many outdoor uh, events, but, um, present the island bars there's there's two there's the community center bar and there's the sailors bar they will be the main venues for music making in the past up until really until the 60s and up a little bit later it was island homes the cottage kitchens were were the main venues for gathering for having house dances for for music making um and there was a community hall which was a dance hall opened probably in the mid 40s and i think by the late 60s that sort of declined a bit but really you looked at it, like the island went from uh, music in, in domestic spaces to music in the public bars so that will be there's no dedicated music venues such music was always tied to socializing and social activity so there's no performance like uh dedicated theater spaces or things like that. And certainly not any outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. Something that we haven't talked about is the monetary or remuneration for musicians. And just wondering when it's in a bar like that, would musicians be paid or do they just do it for the joy of it and have other day jobs? Again, uh, that, that depends on the on whether the musicians have been hired by the bar or whether they, they okay. just come along for their own for their own interest. But during the tourist season, 
the bars would hire musicians to perform. Um, mm -hmm. And again, they'd hire people maybe at bigger community events to, you know, to make music for the evening. But the there were also plenty of opportunities for spontaneous, um, non-paid sessions mm -hmm. yeah. of, of traditional music and popular music, whatever, all that, whatever, whatever people are willing to play, you can hear here. Sounds like a really lovely place to be, especially in the summertime. Um, all that music going on. Um, Bernadette Schmeiser asks, wonders about the population. Um, has it remained, uh, so it has remained stable for the past 50 years. And do you think that it's reached an optimal state? An optimal state? Uh, I couldn't say. And there, <laughs> there'll be a lot of different opinions on that. Right. Uh, all, I, all I could suggest is that the population range at the moment, I'll say the range in the last 50 years, has, hasn't has impacted people's ability to socialize and, you know, gather with music making and, um, and maintain a sense of community. So obviously, we could, we could have another 100, 150 people here, and it would you know, it'll benefit the community, but and maybe it could go down a little bit. I don't know. I wouldn't like to see that happening, but mm -hmm. I don't know what optimal might be. Sure. Yeah. And then following on that, Jared Bateman asks, um, how do you feel the readily available daily ferry service affects the population on the island? And does the ease of leaving the island help or hurt population stability? Uh, as with any infrastructure or technological input into the island it has it it adds to island life i there are others where i would say it has positive and negative but i would say that the ferry only has a positive impact because it allows people to connect to the mainland and it creates that sort of sense of that lessens the isolation somewhat because it's still it's still not a, a an easy journey uh, during the winter anyway you know there's the ferries are disrupted quite a lot and um, but uh, it can, it can, I can only say it's a positive impact, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yes, I was thinking about back to your um, travel here last year, um, and you said, I think that that first uh, step getting to the, the main airport was, was the hardest for you coming across from Clare Island and getting to the airport. So I can imagine in the wintertime, it would be pretty, uh, pretty challenging. We have those challenges here ourselves. Um, Kate Bevan Baker um, points out to a book that's behind you, the Thomas Torino book. And uh, already um, Deirdre has responded to it in the chat, but I thought it was an interesting point that he writes about the importance of repetition in forms of participatory music making and wondering she's wondering if there's any particular tune or song type that is most popular on Clare Island not at present um, and I particularly put that bit it's important for my perspective when I use talk about music making but um, there, there would have there. Certainly, in the past, uh, in the set dancing, there are forms which were repeated, you know, numerous times during a night. So the Clare Island half set, and the tunes which have would have been played to it would have, might have been repeated numerous times during the night, with mm -hmm. the aim of creating that participatory space that, that people can join in the dance, knowing the form. And you know, easily easily join in because the main goal being that people dance, not that they learn all these intricate fancy steps. And that it, the goal, in part, was that just to get everybody participating and um, being there. Mm, yeah. Wow. I think of singing in the, the same way. If you know the words and sing along, you feel better than just if you're sitting on the sidelines. So <laughs> there's definite parallels with uh, with singing and, and dancing. Um, I had a question that um, you've, you've talked about it a bit about, you know, the about music making that ties um, is so powerfully tied to community vitality, but just wondering if there are other lessons um, or things for other islands and communities to think about. Um, I haven't really, really expanded it 
expanded that part of it to think about other islands. Perhaps um, what might be of interest is to examine how the frameworks of population, built infrastructure and environment, how they might be different on other islands and how they in turn might shape music making. So, you know, other islands are slightly, with slightly larger populations, slightly smaller population, or with access to, maybe islands with access to dedicated venues for music making. Like the, mm. I, I'm just, just thinking off the top of my head here, that, that might be a way to apply this to other islands, I don't know. Hmm. Well, that was gonna be my last question, although there might be a few more in the chat if they come up, but what's next with your research? Where, where would you like to go with it? And, and um, if you were awarded a postdoc or, or a great research job in a wonderful university, um, what other avenues would you like to pursue with, with this kind of research? Well, um, what I would like to do is to expand the, the current research with um, more ethnographic work looking at how how infrastructure and technology have have shaped sort of the island experience over the last again during the same that same sort of time frame of the lived you know the experience of the lived community the living community so to expand it by looking at like, keeping music there as a as a representative of social and cultural activity, but to look at technology and infrastructure and then allow that to feed back in. Because when I spoke to people about, about music making in the past, like the thing which kept on jumping out was, the, was how changes in, in buildings, in access to the mainland, in access to instruments, in access to, to music, you know, through, through, radio and television how that shaped their experience of being on the island so that was something that was hinted at a lot even though i was looking more at music but um yeah it, the next step will be to to add that to to what i already have and uh, expand that that expand the research by adding more of a heart like a a tangible side to it, you know, the, mm -hmm. the infrastructure, the music is so, so intangible in one way. That will be my hope. Oh, lovely. Um, there was one other um, question from Jim early on and um, was wondering about to what extent Claire is influenced by the larger island, the uh, you know, of, of Ireland with its own distinct music culture. We often talk about islands off islands in island studies. Yeah, well, clearly, Clare Island is an Irish island, and <laughs> it's full of Irish people who live on an island rather than, you know, yeah. Clare Islanders. But but there is a you know, there is a distance, and um, I don't think you can separate the two, except for maybe the the larger narrative about island life, which sort of comes from the outside it's what what islanders are told about island life maybe that's that's the influence that um mm. that in the past the narrative was that islands were doomed or they weren't they were unsustainable or all these things were coming from the outside rather than from the inside but then they're internalized within the island and now Clare island as one of the islands of ireland is is a, it's an integral part of the state's heritage. That's how, I, I think that's how it was phrased. But, uh, so th that, that's the influence uh, that I, I see because, because we're Irish, we share, you know, the cultural heritage and the, the language changes and all this, this, the social, political and economic history is shared between Clare Island and the mainland. But, uh, it's that internal perception, I think, is where the where Ireland really influences the Islanders. Mm, what a beautiful 
sentiment. I, I love that. And thinking about islandness and, and uh, identity and, and what we hold important. So um, before I thank you formally, um, is there anything else that you'd like to, to add about um, music and Ireland and islands and music making? Um, in this format, I don't, I don't know if there is. I mean, this is a fantastic uh, way to to reach out from from an island. Like I'm, I'm sitting here at home on Clare Island and speaking to you in Canada and all that sort of stuff. But uh, no, there's nothing. There's nothing that really comes to mind. <laughs> If we were here in Prince Edward Island in the faculty lounge down the hallway, we might have to have a guitar and finish <laughs> up with tune. <laughs> but we won't make you do that today because who knows what the sound would be like. But no, Roy, thank you so much for, for doing this. And um, it's a wonderful conversation. Um, I um, And I know that uh, it's almost supper time for you, so we won't keep you any longer. But um, and even though we're gathering through a screen, I feel like it's it's been an engaging and enriching, enriching conversation and a wonderful testament to how we as islands and humans are able to make real connections, even when we're miles or, as in this case, oceans apart. So again, thank you so much for, for being here with us and, and sharing your work with us. Thank you, Laurie. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, anytime. Anytime. And anytime you can want to come back, we'll make sure that there's a room for you here. So I want to now take this opportunity to thank everyone that's in the audience for joining us today and for sharing part of your day with us for this wonderful and inspiring conversation about the power of music and community. It's a wonderful community and we're so glad that you're part of it and we would like to welcome you back our next time, whenever it is, our next Island Lecture Series will let you know. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.